On December 18th, two days after the end of our patrol, the crew was presented to the commanding admiral, who showered us with praise and medals. As he fastened another iron cross to my chest, it reminded me of all my friends in their iron coffins. By that sunny day in December of 1943, nearly all of the old guard of the Atlantic Front had been eliminated, and many newcomers from the German ports were being hacked to bits in the Norwegian Sea before they could achieve their operational goals. The Mediterranean, too, was a deadly battleground. The latest boat to fall victim was U-593, under the command of Kelbling, the one-time guest commander aboard U-557. His successful career was terminated just after he had torpedoed a British escort near the North African coast. American destroyers caught up with his boat and sent her down to the bottom. What our U-boats had not achieved in four years, supremacy on the seas, the Allies had attained in a matter of seven months. Their all-out drive to sweep the seas clean of U-boats was almost an accomplished fact. Only a small force of U-boats was afloat after the bloody massacres in summer and fall. As of that December, the Allies had destroyed 386 of our boats, of which 237 had been sunk in 1,943 alone. Siegmann and most of the crew departed that day after the medals had been distributed. I became acquainted with the officers in the compound, who shared the same way of life and the same doubtful future. My new friends introduced me to the city and to their hectic activities in this exotic port. We celebrated all the parties as they came. They came in rapid succession and were welcomed with desperate abandon. One evening I attended an exhausting fete at which boys and girls bathed in a huge punch bowl of wine and champagne. At another wild affair, a spectacular scene was created by a young Italian girl who, rejected by her Navy lover, threw herself nude into the arms of an army lieutenant. Just when the mild climate of the Côte d'Azur had convinced me that spring was coming, Christmas arrived. The meagre imported evergreens, garnished with lametta and angel's hair, contrasted oddly with the palm trees and made the holiday seem unreal. During the week after Christmas, a bus provided by the flotilla took us few northerners on a tour of the southern French shore. An abundance of semi-tropical flowers, as well as tall cypresses and luxuriant pines, graced our sightseeing route between the resort towns of Lavardon, Saint-Tropez and Saint-Maxime. New Year's Eve was highlighted by a theatrical presentation and wild celebrations in the flotilla's mess halls. I danced through the night with the young girls from the ballet and forgot that the oceans were reverberating from a thousand depth charges and our cities crumbling under the Allied bombings. My days in Toulon ended when Riedel returned from his short leave. He had not had much luck with his travelling. In the wake of great disruptive Allied air raids, he had been unable to make it all the way home to Bohemia, and had spent most of his furlough on trains and in Munich. I turned my business over to my friend, who now succeeded me as exec aboard U-230. For a last farewell, I reminded him, Keep your eyes open and your ears stiff, old fox. It was indeed my last farewell to Riddell. One year later, he was lost on his first and only mission as captain of U-242 in the final battle around England. My journey to commander's school in Neustadt began in the evening of January 5th, 1944. I was chauffeured from Toulon to Marseille by one of my new friends who drove at suicidal speeds over the winding cliffside road. I checked into a small hotel on the Canabier at midnight, slept till noon, then rushed out in my civilian suit to sample the most notorious city of the continent. Sailors, beggars, former French soldiers still wearing their old uniforms, thieves, prostitutes, Arabs, Chinese, blacks and whites all, milled about in furtive harmony. I walked through the crooked alleyways of the old section, along the smelly piers, past the fishing boats and old rotting vessels of yesteryear. I boarded a small motorboat which sailed across the bay to the ancient Chateau d'If, known best as the prison of the fictitious Count of Monte Cristo. That night I strolled through the elegant quarter and surrendered to a quiet evening in a cosy restaurant, where I was served an excellent dinner in old-fashioned splendour. At eight o'clock on January 6th, I climbed the wide staircase to the station St. Charles and boarded a train to Strasbourg. 
while I was carried peacefully through the summery hills and valleys of southern France, in Russia, Soviet divisions pounded the German lines as an overture to their winter offensive. In Italy at Monte Cassino, the Americans bombarded our front in an attempt to break through to Rome, and on the British Isles the engines of a thousand bombers were being readied for the night's assault of the continent. My express arrived in Strasbourg at 22.30 and crossed the Rhine at Kale around midnight. In Mannheim we halted and stayed halted. To investigate the cause of the delay, I went out into the raw cold of the platform. A shadowy railroad employee told me that Frankfurt was under heavy air attack. They say it's the worst. It looks as though we have to stay here for some time. I had a sudden urge to run ahead of the train. Wild thoughts of what was happening to my parents and home raced through my mind. Only after a long delay did the express creep out of Mannheim and through its extensive freight yard. Then it crawled with exasperating slowness toward burning Frankfurt. A grey, misty cold morning had replaced the agonising night before the train edged cautiously into Frankfurt's damaged main station. I grabbed my suitcases and ran through the stench of fire and cordite, through clouds of dust and heaps of broken glass to the street. The large plaza in front of the station was a shambles. The gracious rotunda of stately buildings was reduced to smouldering ruins. An enormous smear of dark fumes lingered over the city. Fire engines, military trucks, anti-aircraft brigades, ambulances and people by the thousands crowded the streets in a massive effort to fight the flames and clean the thoroughfares of debris. Stumbling over rubble and skirting bomb craters, I hurried across the plaza, turned into Mainzer Landstrasse, made a left turn into Savignestrasse, circumnavigated a huge bomb crater in the midst of the street, noticed thousands of aluminum foils which the raiders had dropped to make our radars ineffective, and rushed on for another 50 metres. Then I made a discovery that relieved my fears. Our house was still standing. I opened the heavy iron gate, walked to the entry and rang the bell. There was no answer. Assuming the bell was out of order, I went to the rear to call. There, where a garden had been, lay a great pile of bricks, mortar, iron railing, window frames, glass, radiators and pipes. The entire rear wall of the house had been sheared off by a bomb, exposing all five storeys. Four of the five floors had already been evacuated. The exception was the second floor, our apartment. I recognised my parents' bedroom, the furniture still standing, the beds unused, neatly arranged but loaded with dust. There was the sewing room with the machine facing an imaginary wall. There was my sister's room with the turquoise decor. In one corner of the apartment hung a bathtub halfway in the air. There was no sign of my parents or my sister. A woman appeared on the first floor and called, It's good you arrived. We wondered whether anybody would come and take care of the furniture. It might as well be you. Recognising the woman as the landlord's wife, I said, can you open the apartment? I don't have keys. Can be arranged. I'll also get some neighbours to help you to clean up. I assumed from her nonchalance that my parents were off on a routine visit. After the landlady gave me the key, I let myself in and surveyed the damages. The doors to the rear rooms were split and out of plumb. All pictures had fallen off the walls. The floor was strewn with the items blown off tables and dressers. Relatively little had been destroyed, only glassware and some porcelain vases, but a thick layer of dust covered the furniture, beds and floors. In order to tackle the clean-up task, I changed into some old clothes I found in my room, then answered a knock on the front door. Expecting several husky male helpers, I was surprised by the sight of four middle-aged women, all of them dressed in light grey fatigues like professional movers. They walked in as if our apartment were their own, and together we pushed the furniture around and cleaned and moved it into the vestibule and front rooms. It was late in the afternoon when the women rushed off without accepting my thanks. After changing back into blues, I went to the Army's information centre, received food tickets, sent one telegram to my new command explaining my delay, and several others in different directions to tell my parents, wherever they were, to return. Then I searched for a place to eat. Four restaurants of pre-war splendour proved to be bombed out ruins. In the fifth, a well-known spot on Kaiserstrasse, the fine linen had been replaced with paper placemats, 
and the elegant waiters with morose matrons. The distasteful dinner came as a rude shock after the fine food I had been served in Marseille. It was an obvious irony that Frenchmen, having lost the war, ate like kings while we, the victors, lived on potatoes and ersatz. As night covered the tragic city and its people trembled anew in fear of attack, I returned to our battered home and listened to the air raid warnings on the radio until the danger of another assault had diminished. I awakened bathed in sunlight and gazed about at my strange yet familiar surroundings. On the wall opposite my bed hung a drawing of a nude woman I had made when I was 18. Mother always wondered who had been modelling for me at that early age. Nearby hung a reproduction of Rembrandt's Man with a Helmet, and next to it the gypsum mask of the Inconnue de la Seine, the unknown beauty who had been found floating in the river in Paris, face down. On the wall opposite the windows I had fastened my navy trophies, the emblems, flags and ribbons of my commands, and on the shelves along the walls were the books I had purchased in stores scattered through half of Europe. This was my room much as I had abandoned it in 39 for a war which I had been told would be won in a matter of months. Nevertheless, four years of constant struggle had propelled me to the heights in my chosen profession. I suppressed the feeling of pessimism that had been nagging me more and more of late. Soon, soon, we would bring this ugly war to a victorious conclusion. It was dark when a key turned in our front door. My parents had returned. Mother and Trudy were bewildered, but father said with a sigh, Well, we have to get used to some missing floor space. It could have hit worse. We are together again, and let us drink to that. Father opened two bottles of Moselle wine. We toasted my double promotion, their narrow escape, and our belief that the Allies had to hit much harder to throw us off balance. We stayed together in the study till three o'clock in the morning, talking and listening to the radio warnings of enemy aircraft infiltrations. Then, since no Allied bombers were heading toward Frankfurt, we risked going to bed. Late the following night, I stepped off the lazy train in the Baltic seaport of Neustadt, where an advanced U-boat training centre had been established. I found a vacant bunk in one of the clean wooden barracks and flung myself onto a mattress filled with straw. At eight o'clock the next morning, I found a small group of prospective commanders already practising on a simulator. This complex mechanism, which resembled the interior of a conning tower, was mounted over a large pool and could be moved in every direction over scale models of freighters, tankers and destroyers. The simulator allowed the student commander to familiarise himself with the techniques and tricks of submerged attacks until his choice of tactics became routine. Having had sufficient experience on the front, I managed with ease. After two weeks of intensive practice and a boring life in the compound near the small town, I welcomed my transfer to Danzig for active shooting. One day in late January, I boarded the train to Danzig. The station platform teemed with thousands of infantrymen of every rank, and they all stormed the express in a last-minute effort to find a seat for their long journey to the Russian front. I accommodated myself in a smoky compartment with several army officers. They were puffing cigarettes of Russian machorka, a tobacco they had learned to smoke for the lack of anything better. Soon I offered them my aromatic Turkish cigarettes, still available to us Navy men. This gift considerably improved relations between the infantry and the U-boat force, and also the air in the compartment. While the express scurried east, we talked about the war in general and the Russian campaigns in particular. These men from the front were unanimous in their conviction that their lines would hold against the vast and relentless Soviet onslaught. Said one officer, the few metres we give them here and there are but tactical adjustments. The Soviets don't have our industrial capacity, stated another old fox from the infantry. They haven't the material to maintain their attacks or to stop ours, said a third. Their clumsy equipment can never stand up to our new weapons. Just wait till summer comes. I also talked to several of the fighting men and they confirmed the general feeling that by spring our new weapons and new strategy would drastically change the somewhat embarrassing situation on the various fronts. As we neared Danzig, I wished them luck on the Russian steppes. In Danzig, a streetcar brought me to the pier where the large ocean liners of the Hamburg-America line had moored for years. 
I found the steamer which housed the 23rd U-boat flotilla in dilapidated elegance. My quarters, an antique stateroom finished in plush and velvet. Although it smelled of mothballs and cigars, I felt an immediate affection for the ship. I found the commanding officer, Capitaine Lueth, in the bar with young officers who made up my group of prospective captains. Lueth, a former commander with over 230,000 tons to his credit, greeted me informally and introduced me to the men. I learned that only two of us student commanders had come from the U-boat force, and none of the others had participated in a single war patrol, as was customary in previous years. They had been recruited from destroyers, minesweepers, capital ships and desk positions to offset our terrible losses. The novices had been given one year of training to learn lessons that had taken me three years of active U-boat duty to master. They all lacked the essentials that only combat could provide. Split-second reaction, the sensing of the enemy's next move, the experience to know when to crash dive, when to stay on surface and shoot, how to handle the boat when depth charges and bombs came raining down, how to meet a thousand emergencies. These raw newcomers, who would be entrusted with a U-boat in just a few weeks, stood almost no chance of surviving, and neither did their crews. Before dawn the next day, our shooting practice began with the sailing of seven U-boats and a contingent of surface vessels. Our torpedoes were propelled with compressed air, which left a clear wake for the grading of our performance during daytime, and were equipped with luminous dummy heads, which revealed our hits at night. Our teachers drove us through a long, exhausting schedule of hair-raising manoeuvres that forced us to think and act instantaneously and soundly under emergency conditions. This gruelling routine was kept up six days a week for four weeks, with very little time off for sleep or relaxation. At the end of the ordeal, the participants assembled in the mess hall, dressed in blues and white shirts and black ties, to be informed of their grades in the course. I learned that I had finished with top rating. I wanted only one reward, the command of a new wonder U-boat. Two evenings later, I received the order that crowned my naval career. We had gathered for our farewell party in the smoky bar of the liner. After the commanding officer ended his speech with commendations and good wishes, he reached for the bundle of teletypes from Admiral U-boats. Minor Heron, here are the instructions for your future assignments aboard U-boats, I'll start with the only combat command I have to offer tonight. It's for the lucky winner of the top ticket, Oberleutnant Werner. I rose to my feet. His voice suddenly seemed far away, as though coming through a thick wall of fog. I heard Luth saying, You'll report to the first U-boat flotilla in Brest and assume command of U-415 as of April the 1st. I walked toward him and accepted the order. It was as good as a death sentence for the life expectancy of a boat on battle duty had been reduced to four months or less, and the obsolete U-415 had already outlived too many patrols. This honour, this bright new command, was merely a matter of changing vehicles for an early ride to the bottom. I returned to my table, carrying the teletype and wearing a frozen smile to hide my chagrin. As if to ease my disappointment, U-boat headquarters allowed me a two-week furlough before I was to assume my new command. March was a good month for my favourite sport of skiing, and I headed for the Alps expecting much snow and fast slopes. Changing trains in Berlin, I closed my eyes to the vast destruction and continued on a slow express through smouldering cities and untouched country villages. I reached the small Bavarian town of Immenstadt, around 1400 on the second day of my journey. I left the train to board a locale to Oberstdorf, the well-known ski resort. A second train had just pulled into the small station and scores of passengers were dismounting when I heard someone calling me. I turned and looked into the face of a girl I once had loved. I put down my suitcase and she, without hesitation, threw herself into my arms. What a pleasant surprise, Marika. What are you doing here? Just passing through, she said, her eyes glistening with tears of joy. 44. So am I. Where are you going from here? I am on my way home. I've been at my parents' place for some time. I asked myself why she had insisted on this Wiedersehen. She could as well have let me pass, just as she had eight years ago. Before I found an answer, Marika had already made up her mind for the both of us. Let's skip the trains. 
We can't leave now after seeing each other only for seconds. We investigated train schedules and discovered that we had almost three hours before we would have to part again. After depositing the suitcases at the luggage counter, we stepped into the snow-covered street. Marika clung to my arm and babbled happy questions and answers. She had beautiful blonde hair and her fine features had matured well. We found an empty cafe two blocks from the station and took a window seat with a stunning view of the snow-covered peaks. Eight years had blurred my memory of our youthful affair. We had met in the public rose garden of a small medieval town on the north shore of Lake Constance, where the roses blossom until December. We had both fallen in love for the first time in our young lives and had not known what to do with our new discovery. It had been nothing but promises, kisses and cautious embraces. When I had parted from the lake, we had vowed to treasure our love and to write often. But eight months later, her letters ceased. Our twelve months of separation had been sufficient to turn her from an innocent child into a bride. It was her colourful wedding announcement which had put an end to the role she had played in my dreams. Since then, I had forgotten her almost entirely, until now when she crossed my path again. Marika painfully explained why she had broken off our love so long ago. It was a classic story. Sometime in March of 1938, she had met a young law student who seduced her during the happiest and gayest night of the carnival season. Soon she learned that she was pregnant. The result? A wedding and the birth of a child she had never wanted. Humiliations followed. Matrimonial rapes, she called them, filled the years. With a new life under her heart, it happened that she met me again. This was all that was needed to make her feel sorry for the previous years. She pleaded, Please, don't leave me again. Don't go away now that we have found each other. Let us make the most of it. Have your vacation with me. I objected at first, but it was not hard to give in to her protestations of love and the stirrings of my old feelings for her. I proposed that she follow me to Oberstdorf where nobody knew us and where we could register as husband and wife. I bought a second ticket and claimed our luggage. Then we boarded the old-fashioned train to Oberstdorf. The clerk in the hotel guided us to a suite. When the door fell into its lock, eight years and an endless war vanished. Over our meagre wartime breakfast, I broached the subject of skiing. Marika was not only lovable, she was also understanding. I rented a complete ski outfit, and she accompanied me to the small station from which a lift ran to the peak of Nabelhorn, the highest mountain in the area. As the cable car carried me out over the steep slopes and ravines, I lost sight of Marika. At the uppermost terminal, I mounted my skis and climbed to the summit. The day was remarkably clear. Around me spread the breathtaking panorama of the Swiss, Austrian and German Alps. Those mountains conveyed to me the same feeling of immense power that I always experienced while sailing the Atlantic at the height of a hurricane, and I wished to defy them as I did the mountainous waves. I plunged into a headlong descent down the steepest slopes, past the most dangerous cliffs, until the tree line forced me to reduce speed. Only after hours and several hair-raising descents could I return satisfied to Marika in our hotel suite. The war had not yet touched the town in the mountains. One peaceful day followed another. During the morning hours, I regularly rode to the peak of Nabelhorn and worked the slopes until it was time to meet Marika. In the evenings, we enjoyed dinner and drinks, dancing or a movie. Apart from my violent exercise, the days and nights passed in perfect peace. Yet here, as everywhere, the war was a grim reality. All one had to do was turn on the radio. Day after day and night after night, Broadcasts told us of infiltrations by Allied bomber fleets, warning the citizens of the Reich where attacks had to be expected and where raids were already in progress. The repetitious pounding reports soon cast a pall over the charming village, and as the week progressed and the time came closer for assuming my command, I grew more and more uneasy. The mountains, the snow, the skiing, and Marika too gradually lost their allure. Three days before I had planned to depart, the morning news revealed that Frankfurt had again been under severe attack the previous night, its worst since the raids had begun. With all communications into Frankfurt disrupted, I was unable to contact my parents. Now nothing could hold me in the resort. Marika and I left the hotel and the town together, 
but parted in Immenstadt, where we had met. Her train steamed toward the east. I boarded the express west to Lake Constance, Black Forest, Frankfurt. My train climbed over the hills and wound its way through woods and valleys. It reached Lindau, the island in the lake, at dusk, and one hour later, in the dark and fog, it pulled in at Oeberlingen. Here my relatives lived, far away from screaming sirens. Their daily anxieties centred around their small problems. They knew nothing of the war at sea, had probably forgotten that I existed, for the fanfares which had heralded our successes had long since been silenced. As the train stood still with its steaming engine, I saw in the faint light of a feeble lantern one passenger boarding the express. He wore an army uniform. In the second it took him to pass by the window of my darkened compartment, I recognised my uncle. As he stepped into my car, I said in a disguised voice, There is a seat available at the window, Herr Major. My uncle lighted a match, held it in front of my face and said, What the devil are you doing in this part of the world? I had a few days leave between two assignments, I answered. I am on my way back to the front via Frankfurt. There was a pause, just long enough to hint of trouble at home. Quickly I asked, Have you heard from my parents? They are alive, but don't return to Frankfurt. They've lost everything there. Your parents have found refuge in the station hotel in Karlsruhe. I talked to your mother just a couple of hours ago. I pressed my lips together and held back a sudden wave of anger. Fortunately, it was too dark for my uncle to see the expression on my face. It must have been contorted with bitterness and sorrow, as I thought of all my parents' wasted effort, of all the anguish and death my country suffered. There was silence for a short time. Then my uncle began to talk about his new career as a commandant of a prisoner of war camp. He told me tales of a different war, in which insane violence was replaced by insane indolence. Uncle's appointment had come after a long string of bad luck. He had been at odds with the regime ever since January 1st, 933. As a result of his opposition to the party, which he had courageously made the policy of the newspaper he owned, the government had put him out of circulation. He had spent years in exile in the country, supported by his relatives. With the war had come the demand for men. As a previous officer of the Kaiser's army, Uncle had been reinstated in his rank, promoted, and soon put in charge of the POW camp. One hour before midnight, we bade farewell in the blackest part of the Black Forest, in a cold station house where a few female volunteers brewed coffee and soup for soldiers on the move. I sipped a hot bouillon until it was time to board the local to the lowlands and the Rhine. Eventually, after an interminable six-hour ride, the train slowed down in Karlsruhe station. I rushed across the plaza into the hotel, and a clerk showed me to the room. Who is it? Father's voice answered my knock. It's me, was all I could say. Father was pale, and his hair was suddenly quite grey. Mother and Trudy wept at the sight of me. To overcome the shock of grief and reunion, father suggested that we go downstairs for breakfast. It talks better that way, he said. At the breakfast table, however, the conversation never really did get underway. Trudy, still disturbed, was very quiet. Mother, more resolute, regained her balance soon. Father told me that they had survived the air raid in the cellar, where they had been trapped for many hours, and that they had left behind a few suitcases that he was determined to salvage. He had already secured a truck for that purpose, and to move their few belongings to his new plant. We departed immediately by train to Darmstadt, met the driver with his truck, and then proceeded on the country road to Frankfurt. We entered the city from the south and passed many shattered smoking buildings. Firemen were still digging out the dead, and we saw rows of bodies neatly laid out on the sidewalks and covered with blankets. The truck crossed the bridge over the main river, rumbled through the debris and passed the blackened facades of broken buildings. We drove across the station plaza, around a few bomb craters, and into the devastated Savignestrasse. Large heaps of rubble and remnants of walls were all that remained of many stately apartments. The truck came to a halt before a mountain of mortar and steel that once had been our home. The first story of the attached building was still standing, piled high with the junk from the top floors. 
It was because the floor had held firm that rescue workers were able to dig through the basement to cut a passage into our building and drag my family and others to safety. Only that thin margin of luck had saved me from becoming an orphan. I followed father into the cellar of the neighbouring building. His flashlight revealed a hole in the wall just about big enough to crawl through. I had the terrible feeling that the ceiling would come crashing down on us. Father's hollow voice drifted back to me from our cellar. Come over here, this is where we sat it out. I crawled in and saw in the beams of our flashlights benches and cartons covered by a heavy layer of dust. I said, I guess you were frightened, waiting down here. Believe me, I know how it feels in a coffin like this. It was no picnic, son. It was like Flanders in 1916, when I was buried in an underground bunker. We brought our last belongings to the surface, and the husky driver heaved them onto his truck. Mother was again in tears. She had made the mistake of climbing the hill of debris in search of her belongings, and she had found some broken pieces of her former world. As father led her away from the ruins, he professed optimism. We'll get all new furniture, don't you worry. The Tommies and Yankees will pay the bills. Army trucks and ambulances slowed our exit from Frankfurt, now no longer our hometown, now a dying city. A generation of comfort and happiness ended as we escaped the heavy traffic and turned south onto the Autobahn. Less than an hour later, the truck turned off the highway and drove into the small town of Fungstadt, where father had established his new plant. We jounced over old cobblestone roads and into the yard of a dairy, which father had rented for the production of his patented foodstuff. We stored the boxes and suitcases in his new office, then father proudly took us on a tour of his new place, which sparkled with white ceramic tiles on walls and floors. My departure for Brest could not be delayed any longer, so we hurried by truck back to Karlsruhe station. It was dusk when we arrived, and my train was on time. Hastily, I embraced my parents and sister. I was confident that their ordeal was over and that they would be safe for the rest of the war. As the train pulled out, I saw them standing on the platform, waving. I watched them for a long time till the darkness swallowed them. It was April 4th, 1944, when the train deposited me in the ancient, charming, but somewhat dilapidated town of Brest. An old bus took me through town, crossed the drawbridge over the canal, coughed uphill, and continued westward on the familiar approach to the first U-boat flotilla. I noticed a number of blimps floating gently over the harbour in the early morning breeze. They were a new defence measure installed to protect the U-boat bunker from low-level air attacks. Dismounting at the compound, I found the executive offices closed, but a steward led me to the sun deck facing the bay. As I stepped through the French door, blazing sunlight blinded me. The white garden tables were occupied by a dozen men in navy blues. Not knowing the commanding officer by sight, I glanced around at the men's sleeves for the mark of highest rank. One in the group said, Are you the new captain of U-415? Yes, I am. I am pleased to meet you, said the stocky officer with the three gold stripes and the knight's cross under his collar. I am Corvetten Capitaine Winter. Shake hands with my staff. He introduced me to the members of the breakfast party and told the steward to set another place. Winter himself needed no introduction. His reputation was known to all of us in the U-boat force. He had compiled a remarkable record in the early years of the war, sinking more than 150,000 tons of British shipping. He was one of our last surviving aces. While I ate breakfast, Winter and the others told me the latest news. On the positive side, schnorkel assemblies had arrived in the shipyard to be installed aboard three U-boats for trial runs. But almost everything else was just an up-to-date version of our familiar recent troubles. British airplanes were now flying frequent missions under cover of darkness to drop magnetic mines in the harbour at Brest and in waterways leading out to sea. The U-boat war was still stagnating while we waited for the long-promised reinforcements of new weapons and modern boats. A few of our old diving machines were still lurking around the British Isles, the object of massive air and sea hunts. Even the Black Pit area in the middle of the Atlantic, which had long been free of Allied air surveillance, was now patrolled by planes from American aircraft carriers and by swift escorts. 
The current balance sheet, four out of five U-boats failed to return from their patrols a casualty rate that far outweighed our meagre toll of Allied shipping. As the conversation veered off to the war in general, I noticed that officers expressed little concern about our battle line near Monte Cassino, or even about our Russian campaign, which was not going as the army had predicted. Their talk was mostly about the threat of an Allied invasion of the continent. Nobody knew when or where it would take place, but nobody seemed to doubt that it was coming. The men mentioned our recent efforts to strengthen even further our powerful coastal defences to repel the assault at the water's edge. Our leaders had said repeatedly that our Atlantic wall was impregnable, and no one questioned their word. Defeat was impossible. The mere thought of it seemed treasonous to us. Suddenly, Winter rose to leave. Oberleutnant Werner, he said, you will meet the crew of your boat at fourteen hours. In the meantime, make yourself comfortable and prepare something to say to your men. I took the advice of this impressive, sympathetic officer. I moved into a large corner room in the southeast wing of the complex, and soon I was splashing in my private shower, trying to compose a little speech. However, nothing sensible came to mind, and I eventually sat down at the desk to write a draft. That did not work either, so I followed an urge to inspect the compound and bunker. At fourteen o'clock, I met Capitaine Winter and my boat's company in the courtyard of the flotilla. In my impromptu speech, I told the men that I was an old friend of U-415, that we had met last year at a fueling rendezvous in the middle of the Atlantic. I told them I was proud of their accomplishments and honoured to become their captain, that nothing would be changed to upset their routine, and that as long as I was aboard U-415, she would not be defeated. I shook hands with every man, and by 1420 I had taken over boat and crew. At 1425 I gave my first order, instructing the exec to have the boat ready in 30 minutes for exercises in the bay. I was determined to train the men according to my own conception of U-boat warfare. The exec led the crew downhill. I followed with the chief and the second watch officer and asked them about their background. At it turned out, the engineer had been with U-415 since she had been commissioned, but the exec and the second officer had had only limited front experience. Clearly, I would have to assume a good portion of their duties at first. U-415 lay waiting in her berth. I lowered myself through the bridge hatch into the conning tower and experienced an unpleasant surprise. The periscope in the tower was one of the earliest designs. I was accustomed to a fully automatic tube equipped with swivel seat, electric drive, numerous gadgets, and an integrated computer system. But to use this prehistoric scope, one had to squat to look through its eyepiece, and following the up and down movements of the long shaft would be an acrobatic exercise. A thorough inspection of the boat revealed no other discrepancies except her age. She was an old workhorse. Nonetheless, the large new arsenal of radar detection gear plus two 20mm two-barreled guns and a sophisticated 37mm automatic, compensated for the lack of an advanced periscope. All that afternoon and the following three days, I sailed U-415 through the Bay of Brest, drilled the men in diving manoeuvres, and let them practice on the anti-aircraft guns with live ammunition. I added a few innovations that I had found extremely valuable, and which the men accepted with a well-developed instinct for survival common to all hunted creatures. I drove the men hard, bringing them to peak performance and deepening our relationship. By the fourth day, I was confident enough of boat and crew to report to Winter that we were fit for patrol. From that moment on, everything went according to routine. Duties that had been mine for years were now taken care of by my officers and I had time enough to steal my nerves and fortify my spirit for the mission. On the third day of the fitting out of U-415, I received my first operational order and met with Winter in his office shortly after breakfast. He was nonchalant as he briefed me on my assignment. We have temporarily suspended our long patrols into the Atlantic in favour of shorter operations into areas where the convoy routes converge. Observe. Unfolding a large yellow sea chart, Winter pointed out the area that headquarters had chosen for my first battles as a captain. You will recognise that your square is in a strategic location, commanding the westerly approach to the English Channel, 
Studying the chart, I realised that the bottom was at an average of 150 metres below mean water level. Operating in such shallow waters had its advantages as well as disadvantages. I also realised that enemy air surveillance and hunter-killer groups were concentrated in the area, and that there would be little chance to surface for air and a charge of the batteries. Under such conditions, a U-boat without a schnorkel could hardly be expected to survive a massive hunt by squadrons of aircraft and fleets of destroyers. Common sense told me that U-415 was doomed, and yet I could not believe that I had survived this long just to become a victim of obsolete equipment. I accepted the order, folded the paper, and stuck it into a pocket of my fatigues. Then I saluted my senior and withdrew. Finally the hour arrived, 21.30 on April 11th, 1944. My crew had assembled aboard on the aft deck. There were no well-wishers at the waterfront, no music, no flowers. My commands echoed hollowly in the concrete bunker. U-415 sailed quietly into the shallow inner harbour, stern first, then turned and followed the nervous minesweeper into the long, dark channel leading into the open Atlantic. I had taken this route many times before. However, there was a great difference. I was now in command, with the lives of 58 men in my hands, at a time when our prospects for success and survival were at the lowest. At 22.45, our escort swung around without warning and went on opposite course. As she turned, her skipper wished us good hunting, a valediction that had long since lost its significance. His farewell reminded me that our sailing could not have been a secret, for the mounting threat of an Allied invasion had given the French population hope for an early liberation, and every dockhand, barmaid or girl in the établissements was eager to spy for the British. With the escort's departure, I speeded ahead, we needed speed to dive, and I had not the slightest desire to shoot it out on surface. But in addition to the threat from above, there were the barriers of British mines to contend with. Although I had a tremendous urge to dive, I had to continue on surface until we were in water deep enough to overpass mines and withstand bombs from either side. And all the while, radar impulses chirped ceaselessly all around us. New impulse bearing 140, getting louder! shouted the operator through the tube. Take depth sounding and report steadily, I called into the control room from the bridge. 31, 32, 32. That was not deep enough for us to dive and still pass over a mine safely. Radar impulses increased sharply. The voice came through the tube urgently. 37, 38, 40 metres. Impulses volume four, screamed the voice from below. Alarm! I waited a few more seconds, half expecting to see the searchlight of an attacking aircraft, then leaped through the hole. The boat roared with the familiar crescendo on a downward curve to starboard, but she went down only slowly in shallow waters. As I made a mental note of the fact for never before had I been forced to dive so close to shore, the ocean exploded. One, two, three, four detonations ruptured the sea and hammered against the port side of the hull, tossing the boat sideways each time. Then, with a hard, sudden shock, the boat hit bottom at 46 metres without activating a mine. I doubted that there were any mines at all at this distance from port, and decided that hereafter I would disregard the standing order not to dive within the 80 metre line. At midnight, U-415 was again on surface, alone with the elements and the searching British planes. I checked the phosphorescent dial of my watch in order to establish the interval between our last crash dive and our next. Thirty minutes and nine miles later, we were again forced to dive by three stubborn impulses. The boat had fallen to 55 metres when twelve charges exploded in clusters of four. The hostile bombardiers did not stint their bombs. They fully intended to destroy us. We surfaced again and crash-dived again in a repetitious game of attack and defiance. As the day finally dawned, we dived an eighth time, and with this attack, the bombs wasted on us mounted to 40. U-415 floated, submerged and silent, toward the entrance of the English Channel. Soon our sound gear picked up faint propeller noises and ASDIC pings far in the west. The hunter-killer groups had reacted fast, guided onto our general track by the trail of booms left by the pounding aircraft. I lay on my bunk, 
eyes closed but my mind racing. The sound of the destroyer's screws could soon be heard inside the hull without earphones. For long moments, it seemed that the pursuers had made contact. Their pings drilled through the steel like bits. But time passed, and every hour we floated two miles further north-northwest. By late afternoon, we finally had the ships outdistanced. The moment to surface drew steadily closer. It was the moment when we defied maximum air surveillance, when our fears and our heartbeats reached their peak. However, it was also the time when we got the air and the battery charge we needed to survive. At 22.15, U-415 surfaced into a clear night. Cool air cut into my lungs. A spanking breeze came in from the west. Sheets of spray brushed our faces. What followed was a duplication of the previous night, when the impulses reached unbearable strength, when the air was pregnant with roaming aircraft, we crashed below. The boat bent under the countless concussions, tumbled, listed, and went out of control, then levelled, balanced and floated silently, until we surfaced again into the hot exhaust gases left by our attackers. Throughout the night we played the deadly game, until our batteries were fully charged. With day, submergence relieved us from the nerve-wracking exposures. For five days and nights, U-415 braved the barrages of bombs and depth charges. When the morning of the sixth day finally dawned, we reached our destination and met with more bombardment. On our third day of cruising in Grid Square BF-15, the sound man merely whispered the discovery, Sound band port ahead. This was the sound I wished to hear. The deep thrashing rumble of merchant ships, the rhythmic pounding of piston engines. It was 9.15. The width of the band indicated the convoy was a considerable distance away. I mounted my first attack with the order. Both half ahead, on periscope depth, on battle stations, all tubes ready for action. At once, seamen, machinists and mechanics scurried through the hull in sneakers and stockinged feet, wearing nothing but their blue-knitted underwear. I leapt into the radio room and pressed a pair of earphones against my head. A mechanical symphony fast and slow propellers, turbines, diesel and piston engines greeted my ears. The urge to stop those damned propellers overwhelmed me. I gave up listening and surged into the tower. The crew awaited my action. Up scope stop, right so. I bent my knees before the old, still unfamiliar instrument, peered through its ocular, but saw only light green water. All of a sudden, sunlight entered the eye. The scope had broken surface. Down scope too much. Up, 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 down. Right so. The vessel's black superstructures came into view, framing themselves against the light blue sky like a shadow play. They rocked and swayed eastward in perfect formation, totally unconcerned. No wonder they had made the trip across the Atlantic in absolute safety. I swivelled around to check the waters to my back and counted seven corvettes zealously cruising at various distances. This display of power meant I had to act fast. I downed the scope, ordered the four bow tubes ready for a fan shot, then checked the surface again. U-415 floated on her clandestine path toward the masses of ships. Distance diminished gradually but distinctly. The black silhouettes grew into ships, then became full-sized monsters. Four destroyers raced into our immediate vicinity. Then I realised I would not have enough time to get as close as I had anticipated. Correction. New range 2000. Up scope up up down right so. New range 2000 stands. Cover cover cover. Fan shot ready fire. One by one the torpedoes jumped from the tubes, streaked toward the imposing array of cargo ships, escorts and trawlers. Fifty-eight men counted to the rhythm of their heartbeats. Two minutes went by, no hit. I fixed the scope at the columns far ahead, almost hypnotised by the panorama. Then, one, two, three booms in quick succession. Three black clouds mushroomed within the herd. Then the view was sharply cut off by a huge grey bow. Emergency! Dive to 150! The helmsman moved the handle of the machine telegraph up and down three times. We braced for the impact. U-415 fell away, clawing for depth, her screws churning violently. Only I knew what had happened on the surface, that an escort had found us because I had left the scope exposed for too long. The spread from above exploded just short of the conning tower. 
Six times in quick succession, the boat was beaten and savagely shaken. For moments only the thrust of our propellers was felt. Then a fresh series slammed against the hull, driving the boat further into the depths. The chief levelled her off seconds before she would have rammed into the sand. This noisy manoeuvre brought down a new salvo. We heard the canisters splash into the water, and as they floated down we had little chance to escape them. A dozen detonations, a shattering roar. Somewhere a valve blew, and a fountain of water, thick as an arm, spurted across the aisle. The escorts above us? We heard them with the naked ear assembled for the kill. A third barrage bracketed our trembling boat. Then the devilish grinding of propellers heralded another spread. Though the sun sank into the ocean and night covered the attackers, they still hurled their cans, and the concussions kept crashing our boat into the sandy bottom and blowing her off again in repetitious sequence. By six o'clock the next morning, we had taken eighteen hours of constant beating. The chief had managed to keep the boat afloat in spite of the countless leaks, defects, blowouts and loss of compressed air and power. At noon, the attacks had not lessened. The British attackers quite obviously took turns. We had heard new escorts arrive and take over the chase with a fresh supply. Evening came and the bombardment continued with savage strength. We had long gotten used to the hammering pings and the threshing screws which came and went, stopped, grew nearer, stopped again, ground into reverse, came closer again, and then went into high gear. These were the seconds when the canisters tumbled down, when the explosions hammered against the coffin, when our heartbeats stopped and sparks flashed and water splashed. These were also the seconds when we were rammed into the ground and buried in silt, but found that we were somehow still alive. Midnight once again. The British had pounded us for over 37 hours, dropping more than 300 charges, and were still unwilling to halt the pursuit. At 2.15, however, an erratic movement of the killers led me to believe that they had run out of patience or cans. Their propellers stopped, went on again, increased in revolutions, then grew dimmer. After interminable minutes, the abominable sound faded out at the eastern horizon. The sudden silence hurt our ears. Everything seemed amplified into pounding blows, the beads of moisture dripping on the deck plates, the drops splashing in the bilges, the coughing of hard-breathing men, the ticking of wristwatches. Slowly, very gradually, stress eased, and the crew realised that the barrage was over. One hour later, U-415 shot upward into airy freedom. I dragged myself onto the bridge. The diesels began to roar and the ventilators to sing, and the boat gained speed and raced westward in the dark. Near dawn, we dived. The chief steered the boat at 25 metres, allowing us to receive our first radio communications in over two days. The messages came pouring in. Armed forces communiques disclosed that Berlin, Hamburg and Hanover had again suffered heavy air attacks, that the front in Italy had been broken, and that the Soviets had launched a broad offensive in the south of Russia. We learned from headquarters that three U-boats had been lost while we had been hanging in the noose. U-342 had been bombed and sunk. U-448 and U-515 had failed to answer calls for days and were presumed lost. We intercepted several radiograms directed to other boats, presumed to be afloat, and one intended expressly for us, U-415, discontinue all actions, report position, return to base at once. Obediently we surfaced and transmitted to base our position and word of our score. Knowing that our signal would be detected by the British, we braced ourselves for attacks by their long-range bombers. Only minutes were left for us to replenish our batteries. Some 300 miles separated U-415 from her concrete bunker in Brest. She could have reached it within 30 hours, travelling at top speed on surface. Instead, she was forced to resume her sinuous dives into depth. For four days and four nights, we underdived and escaped the best efforts of the British to sink U-415. But finally we reached the reefs of Brittany, surfaced into a night illuminated by a sickle moon, clung to the wake of an escort, and sailed safely into the narrows of Brest. Close to midnight, our good old workhorse of a boat found her berth in the bunker. The pier was sparsely lighted. Only a few of the flotilla's brass had found the time to greet us. The boat's company stood in stony silence when Winter accepted my salute. 
Soon I was seated in the mess hall next to the commanding officer, and I took the opportunity to ask him a question that had bothered me for five days. Sir, why did headquarters order us to return? Are we finally going to get our schnorkel? See me in my office tomorrow regarding these matters, said Winter. For now, have your dinner in peace and tell me something interesting of your experiences. It's always the same routine. Get up on surface and catch a mouthful of air. Snatch a minute when Tommy isn't looking, duck as soon as he moves around, and surface again when you think he has turned his back. The trick is to find the right moment to take your chance. Between my bites of cold pork and my swigs of cool beer, I told him of the long British pursuit which had almost made that dinner unnecessary. Long after winter retired, the crew continued to celebrate their safe and victorious return. I spent another hour or so at the bar with my officers before I retreated into the solitude of my room. After a long hot soaking in the tub, I sank luxuriously into sweet-scented linen.